Lord. Man, we got a good crowd tonight, Danny. Um, and a good looking crowd. Most of them. <laughs> And we're glad you're here tonight. For those of you that are visiting with us, we're especially glad. We've got some friends I know here from, uh, from uh, Wablo. And I preached over there a few weeks ago. And Brother Jeremy and I have been friends for years. And, and uh, there may be others here from other places, that uh, other churches. And we're certainly glad to have you. To those of you that are members here at Elkton, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. It's uh, very rare that you find the crowd being the same crowd you had on Sunday morning. And with very few exceptions, we've lost very few folks. That's commitment on your part. That, as much as anything, will bring revival. Now, remember, revival doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get bigger, you're going to grow or anything. That, what it means is you're going to grow deeper. You're going to grow deeper. My favorite psalm is Psalms number one. That man that's planted by the water and his roots grow deep. That's where, that's where we ought to be concerned about growing. Not getting bigger, but growing deeper in our commitment and faithfulness to the Lord. We've been talking about, God, how do I know your will for my life? How do I discern that? And we started with 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my uh, people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, we talked about salvation, justification, how we know that we're a child of God. That's step number one. Number two, then, is for us to understand that our life is not our own, that he's given us something by faith, through Jesus to do with while we're on this earth. Now, I'm going to tell you, with a few exceptions scattered around in the auditorium tonight, most of us have most of our life behind us. Amen? Amen. I mean, I've run most of my race, and I know that, and I'm, I'm not afraid of what lies ahead of me. Now, I don't have any better picture than you do. I'm living by faith right up to the end. Aren't you? Oh, I'd love to say I know what heaven's going to be. I know everything about it. I don't have to worry about that. I've you know, got this assurance and that assurance. Man, we are a people of faith. The just shall live by faith. You either walk by faith or you don't walk. I once had a man by the name of Roger Collenbach. Some of you may know Roger. I read, led Roger to the Lord many years ago in Holt Summit in my church office. And the way that it happened was Roger said, Roger's a bit of an intellectual. And uh, I knew I was outwitted. I was outmanned. You know, he's smarter than I am. And I said to him, I said in myself, God, you got to help me here. Uh, this is like David and Goliath here. And I'm David. <laughs> and God said, tell him that unless he comes by faith, he cannot come. And so I did. And the lights came on. And I said, Roger, you know, I, I, I maybe have discovered something. Because he wanted more. God's going to have to show me more, Brother Frank. I can't. I got to have more. I got to have more evidence. And I said to him. Roger, you know what I think? And he said, no. I said, Roger, I think you're right. I don't think you can be saved. He said, what? I said, Roger, I want to tell you that God will give you something else. But I don't know that he will. And so if you're unwilling to accept what he's given you, you're going to reject that. I'm afraid you can't be saved. I said, now, if you'll trust him, put your faith in him. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He says he'll save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I trust God in his word. Well, we went home that night that way. The next evening, about 5 o'clock, Roger came to my office straight from work. And he said, hey, listen, that's bothered me last night, what you told me. And I said, well, it bothered me when I told you. <laughs> but I said, Roger, I don't know of any other way other than by faith. And so if you want me to twist it and make it fit, I'm just giving you false hope. And he said, no. Brother Frank, I'm ready. I don't understand it. 
and I'm the first to admit I don't have all the pieces that I'd like to have. But if you'll pray with me, I'm going to pray to receive Christ. Roger became one of the best deacons I ever had in all of my ministry. He was saved that day. He was baptized. He began to grow in the Lord. He began to walk by faith. He still walks by faith. He's still a very godly man. And he teaches his family and teaches others and works in the church. He is a tremendous, wonderful story. But it started, he thought, without enough faith to do it. Folks, we have to choose to live every day as God's children, knowing, number one, we are not perfect. We are going to sin. Number two, God loves us in spite of our sin. Even though while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And number three, it's not anything that I do that saves me, but it's grace in Him. And the life that I now live is no longer my life, but the life that He has given to me. We talked about that last night. So, therefore, because that's the way it is, we have to build a life based upon righteousness and faith and say, Lord, teach me your ways. Teach me what I'm supposed to be. None of us are born ready. <laughs> We all start out as clumsy little infants. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's an unlikely place to do this, but God's going to talk about our carnality. You may be here tonight and you may say, Brother Frank, I'm just not as spiritual as I need to be. And I would look at you and say, Amen, me either. Because you see, every day is a new day. Every day... Uh, is a day that God has given me out of His grace to live for Him. I have a responsibility to live for Him. And I should live for Him not because I have to, but because I love Him. I want to. I want to tell others, Lord, put people in my path that I can tell about You. Lord, just make me collide with them. So that I can tell you. But I have to be prepared. I have to be ready. And listen to me, church. Look at me. This is what we've lost. I have to be intentional. It's just not willy-nilly. It's God, I am on this earth for this purpose. And I know it. And it's not by accident. And God, help me to be intentional. Help me to pray for people that I know are lost. And help me to go see them. And tell them the gospel story. Tell them what Christ has done in me. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now we're going to have to, we're going to read down to verse 15. And then we're going to come back and make a couple of three points. So stay with me as we read. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Paul asked him a question. This is a little self-assessment time. For while one saith, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? When you say that, who whose are we? We're Jesus. And so we can't come to church because our pastor is Brother Danny or because of Brother Frank. If we do, we're coming for the wrong reason. We cannot do this. We are not. That's not our job. I'm a shepherd, but I'm also a sheep. I'm a sheep that's called out of the flock. To be a shepherd, to lead them in green pastures, to lead them beside still waters. But I'm still a sheep. Let me tell you something. You know who's supposed to grow the church? The sheep. You've never seen a shepherd bear a lamb. That's not who bears lamb. 
We were intended to be saved for the purpose of living our lives so that others would see Jesus in us and say, Hey, Frank, how come you, how come you give a tenth of your money? How come you go to Sunday school every Sunday? How come you go down to the church during that revival? And it opens the door for me to say, hey, I'm a Christian. And being a Christian means I've committed my heart and life to Christ. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that once I knew I was lost and I was doomed for hell, I couldn't save myself. And so I put my faith in Jesus as the Bible tells me to. And we have an opportunity to begin to minister to others. I finally have grandchildren. I haven't had grandchildren. I have a son who's old enough to be married and have children. And he's not married, and so he's no help, right? <laughs> and I have a daughter who's 36 years old who works for the Missouri Baptist Convention uh, in collegiate ministries. But her and her husband don't want any children. So she's no help, right? But my adopted son, Robert, who is a Baptist preacher, he wants children. They couldn't have any children. Lord, what are you doing to me? You're killing me here. But what God gave them was a desire to foster children. And so tomorrow at noon, I will have three grandbabies, not just one. And my goal in life is to teach my grandchildren everything. I'm not going to teach them Grimm's fairy tales. Let somebody else teach them that. I'm not going to do arithmetic with them. I'm not going to, I will if they need it, but that's not going to be my purpose. My purpose is to teach them about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, Ruth, Gideon, all of the Old Testament characters, Samson, Daniel, Elijah, uh, all of those, David. And when they go to Sunday school, they're going to be the kid that everybody hates because he knows all the answers. <laughs> and I want them to say when somebody asks them, who taught you that? My pop taught me that. I want that's the legacy I want to leave with my grandchildren. I want to leave the legacy. Hey, pop loved Jesus and he taught us about Jesus. And he was the example that showed us Jesus. Clarence told me this week on the way down here that his grandfather was the most influential man in his life spiritually. And because, his words, not mine, because of his influence in my life, I am living for Christ today. Ah, what a legacy, huh? What a legacy to leave for my grandchildren to say, hey, I learned about Jesus from my pop. We are to be about making disciples. And sometimes it can be the guy that works on our cars. Sometimes it can be the lady that fixes our hair. Sometimes it can be our kids, our grandkids, our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors. Sometimes it can be the bully kid on the playground that has beat up your grandson and you want to just throttle him, right? But instead, you tell him about the love of Jesus. God uses every situation in mine and your life if we will give him the opportunity and if our focus is to tell others about Jesus. Amen. Now listen, we try to avoid that son. Oh, I don't want to tell them. What if they ask me a question I don't know? Good. Tell them you don't know. I don't know. But let's see if we can find out. Let's find out. Because you see, sometimes we put heaven and being a Christian out of reach. Oh, we've got to be so good. We've got to, we've got to do all these things just right. And they look and say, I can never do that. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus took the woman at the well who had committed adultery. <coughs> and he said to her, I'll give you water to drink. Remember the woman who was thrown at his feet for adultery. And they said to him, teacher, here's what the law says. Don't you love those people? Here's what the Bible says. And they misinterpreted. They missed the whole purpose. And Jesus got down on his hands and knees and he began to scribble in the sand. And he said, I'll tell you what. The one of you that's without sin. You cast the first stone. Now, let me tell you, that's not what the law said. The law said, kill her, stone her. 
Jesus said, okay, you that haven't sinned, you that are without error, you pick up the stone, you stone her. They all left. Notice what Scripture says when you get on. The, the oldest to the youngest. The old ones left first. I huh, wonder why that was. Don't tell the young ones were smarter. They realized. And they left. Jesus picked her up. And he said to her, Woman, where are thine accusers? And she made a mistake. She said, Lord, I have none. Remember what he said? He that is without sin, he cast the first stone. Jesus corrected her ever so gently. And here's what he said when she said, I have none. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Because he could pick up a stone. He was without sin. He was without error. He was without guile. And yet he said, neither do I. The great, one of the greatest pictures of grace we see. Was she worthy of death? Yes. Did she have to die? No. Because God so loved the world. Friends, listen to me. I don't want what I deserve. I want God's grace. Amen. I want God's forgiveness. I want God's mercy. And we got to quit acting like the world needs to get what they deserve. I don't, as I judge, so shall I be judged, Scripture says. So I want forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. Now, if there's no forgiveness, there's no repentance of sin. If, if they never repent, there's no forgiveness. You have to repent. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And God said, okay, but they must confess. They must repent. And when they do that, they come. Friends, listen, the world doesn't know that automatically. We have to tell them. We have to show them. Frank, why do you live like that? Why are you so happy? Why do you go to church? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But because I've committed my heart and life to Jesus, and he's given me opportunity. And this is a way for me to share the gospel. I love to sing, but I'm not a singer. I'm a preacher. I love to preach. You can lay food preaching and singing and I'm going to take the preaching every time unless I'm hungry and it, or it's fried chicken <laughs> right sure because that's what God's called me to and that's my passion but that passion came out of a relationship with the Lord Jesus now listen to me tomorrow we're done so you got to get tonight's message tonight and that is, God has saved you for a purpose. Your life is not your own. We established that last night. But He has saved you for a purpose. And He said, build it on righteousness. That your life can have impact in the kingdom of God. So, He says, you have all these guys. Apollos, Paul, all these people you're following. He says, so then neither is he that planteth anything. That'd be me. The guy casting the seed, preaching the gospel. He's not anything, neither he that watereth. That'd be Danny. He's the one that's going to care for you and pastor you and love you and um, till up the weeds and put a little water on you and let you dry out when you got too much water and all that kind of stuff. He's the gardener. He's the one that's going to care for you. But God that giveth the increase. It's not my preaching. How arrogant could I possibly be? The power is in the Word of God. Paul said it this way in Romans, For it, I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. You know what doesn't come back void? God's Word. So if you put it out, it will always hit its mark. Now, it may not have the result you think, but it can never have the result you think if you don't ever pull the trigger. You got to tell them who Jesus is and what he means to you. Do you know we have every evangelism strategy we could ever have in our lives? 
Why, I, I've learned CWT. I learned the Roman Road. I learned, uh, uh, what was the other one? Uh, Sunday School. Faith Sunday School. Uh, and the other one that was the big for so long and then share Jesus evangelism explosion share Jesus without fear I've been trained in every one of those but you know what people want to hear <clears throat> they want to hear what he did for me man you, you've got to tell your story you have a story and that story is the relationship and the walk that you have in Jesus. And if you don't have one, shame on you. You're a Christian. You're a child of the God. I don't have any trouble when somebody says, did you know John Whitney? Well, sure, I know John Whitney. He was my dad. Well, can you tell me about him? Well, sure, I can tell you about him. I don't have any trouble bearing testimony of my dad, my mom, my wife, my children. When I leave here, somebody's going to ask me about Elton. How'd the revival go, Brother Frank? And I'm going to bear testimony of you. Why is it when it comes to telling people about our Savior, we say, well, you know, I just don't know what to say. Well, tell them what you know. Don't tell them what you don't know. Tell them what you do know. And it may sound something like this. I don't really understand it all. All I know is that I knew that I was not in right relationship with God. And the Bible said that I needed to confess that to God and ask him to forgive me of the places that I've sinned and rejected him and receive him and invite him into my heart to save me. And then to live for him the rest of my life to the best of my ability. That's all I know. No verses. No anything. Now, if you know verses, heck, throw them in there. Right? Tell your story. But listen to me. Your story is good enough. You don't need to flower it up. Don't tell them my story. You'll mess that up, I promise you. Tell them your story. When, uh, when I got a phone call from my, my wife and my son, they asked me, where'd you eat? Where'd you eat? And I said, well, let me tell you, we've eaten lots of good places, but the place I ate that I want to tell you about is a place called Smith's Restaurant. Have you eaten at Smith's? Yeah, yeah. And so when, when I started telling them, I started explaining about this restaurant. Now, I don't know the Smiths. I don't know anything about that. So this is a free commercial. And if, if they're here, you know, I'll, I'll take an honorarium. That's fine. <laughs> but the testimony of my experience is what people are going to want to love. And you know what they're going to say when I tell them? Oh, my, it was so wonderful. Here's what I had. It was so good. You know what they're going to say? Now, where's this at? <laughs> Folks, when we begin to tell people about Jesus and we make it sound good, <laughs> we make it sound like it should be, you know what they're going to ask you? How do you get this? How'd you do this? And then you get to tell them. It's simple. And if you say to them, well, you got to come go to church with me. I'm going to stomp on your toes. <laughs> That's not what they need to hear. Holy Spirit will take care of that. What they need to hear is what he's done in you. Do you know the woman that was caught in adultery, she, or, or the woman at the well, she left the well to go to town to tell everybody what had just happened to her. Do you know it was in the middle of the afternoon? Do you know why she was there in the middle of the afternoon? Because she was a town prostitute and she didn't want to come when the other women was there because she knew she would be hated and looked at and talked about. And so she came in the middle of the afternoon so no one would see her. Now all of a sudden Jesus has got all of her life and now she's going into town and she says, hey, let me tell you about a man who told me everything there is to know about me. Before she didn't want to talk to anybody. Now all of a sudden she wants to talk to everybody. Church, there is something wrong with God's people when we don't want to tell the story of Jesus in our life. Amen. Now, if you're there, 
then you're, it's a good thing you're in revival because that's the place to fix that. If you don't like Sunday school, there's something messed up. If you don't like prayer meeting, there's something messed up. If you don't like gathering together with God's people, there's something messed up. Because that's what God says we will have a desire to do. And if we don't, instead of telling me everything that's wrong with the church, you need to be asking yourself, what's wrong with me? How come I don't want to read God's word? How come I mean every dime I give to the church, I can give with a grip? Oh, How come I don't throw it in the offering plate and say, sick them, God, go get them? <laughs> he don't need your money. Well, he owns the cows on a thousand hills and the taters under the hills. He wants your money because he wants to bless you. But we don't do it. That's why he wants your time. Your talents. We have to walk with him, church. You want to see young people come into your church? Let them see old people excited about Jesus. Anytime young people see old people smiling, having fun, they're suspicious. <laughs> How come those old people are having fun? And they'll come. And when they come and you love them like grandma and grandpa's, guess what? They're coming back. And they're going to bring their babies. And they're going to bring other people. And listen, even if God, did you ever think maybe God doesn't want to grow you to be a young church? Maybe he wants you to, to grow to be a silver-haired senior adult church so that when the young ones do come, they're just swamped with love, flooded with love. Henry Blackaby said this. I think it's one of the greatest statements ever been made in all of theological history. He said, find out where God's working and go there. Amen? God can work here. He's been here this week. And if he hasn't worked here, he's worked up here, I promise you. Because Clarence and I go back to the hotel and we're singing and dancing and talking about God and give you like a, well, like a couple of those, you know. <laughs> and we're excited and we're full and I'm happy and it's a joy to be here. Mm -hmm. That's what God wants us to be in the house of the Lord. David said, oh Lord, the joy of my salvation is gone. Why? Because he drifted away from God into sin. And God cannot be where sin is. Now, I'm not saying you're hideous sinners. I don't know. You seem like pretty nice folks. But I know me. Sometimes I look really good and I'm really bad. <laughs> When I come back from revival, sometimes my wife will come with me and some sweet lady in the church, well-intentioned, will come up to my wife, take her by the hand and say, oh, you are so lucky. As soon as I hear it, I start moving where I can get in line where Shelly can see me, but the other, the woman can't. And I will look at her and go. <laughs> and my precious wife never burns me down in front of anyone mind you and she'll just look at him and blink as if to say bless your heart <laughs> and oh it looks so wonderful but the truth of the matter is we all sin and it makes me mad doesn't it make you mad that I have to sin and fall short of the glory of God. Today, something happened in my life, and I said, Lord, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I? Lord, I'm sorry. Why do I do what I don't want to do when it's so easily for me to do what I should do? My dad used to say when I went through a little spell as a boy, he'd say, son, you would climb a tree to lie to me when you could stand on the ground and tell me the truth. <laughs> Sometimes I think that's how hard I work at not doing what God would have me to do. Church, 
We are not our own. And we are called for a purpose of righteousness. Now we're going to close with this. So listen, I'm late already and, and, and I did it all by myself. Look, look at what he says. So, uh, verse, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. I could preach a whole sermon on that verse. We are not intended to be a Christian all alone. Okay? We're intended to be a community. We're intended to bring our children to church and let our church help grow our children up. We're to be loving, caring, godly people who when someone's sick and in need, we're there to help them. I don't have time and I'm doing it anyway. Sorry. Uh, now, he, uh, I'm sorry, verse 9. If we are labors together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. One quick note. You were founded in 1840. Kim's not here. 54? 1854? 52. Okay, let's let's not fight about it. <laughs> Sometime back there in the, the mid-1850s, prior to the Civil War, there have been a lot of people come through this church and invested in this church that there would be a testimony right here. Amen? We stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. Amen? They weren't perfect, but they said, God said, we need to build a church here. Now, it's under our watch. We're the ones that are building upon what they have left us. We're growing what they have given to us. We're building upon the foundation. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man, man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It's the only one that will last. Now verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation of gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work... This is God's word. Don't be mad at me. Be mad at him. Every man's work shall be made manifest. What does that mean? It'll be made visible. It'll be made where you can see it. Every man's work will be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's going to be purified by the refiner's fire. And that which is God's is going to be imperishable. But that which is wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned away. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be yet saved. Don't lose that little phrase. For he himself shall be yet saved, yet so as by fire. Now, I don't know what that says to you, but let me interpret that for you according to the Gospel of St. Frank. You can be a Christian and live your life and make no impact on the kingdom of God. And all of your work will be burned up. But you'll be saved. Because you see, our salvation isn't based upon our works. Our works don't save us. Our works is an outgrowth of our salvation. Amen. And if we don't have an outgrowth of work from our salvation, something is not right. And church, if we're going to experience revival, if we're going to have revitalization, if we're going to be relevant to the next generation, if we're going to leave a legacy for others to stand on, then we've got to be relevant in this generation, in this time, for such as a time as this has God placed us here. And listen to me. He says we're without excuse. Because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the very same power that he says we have through the Holy Spirit. And greater things than these shall you do if you call upon my name. Church, it's time we begin to build on the righteousness that God has laid before us. Call on the name of Jesus. Stand on that which God has promised to us. And if it falls, if he's a liar, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't fail, don't prop it up. 
Let it stand. And I promise you, it will stand. And God will be faithful every day, day in and day out. I talk to young preachers all the time. I have quite a group of young men that I get to minister to. And they'll get discouraged. And they'll have a mean old deacon or they'll have somebody who's, who's giving them trouble. And they don't know what to do. And I'll tell them, listen, do you feel like God called you there? Yeah. Did you pray about it when you went? Yes. So did God not know that she or he was there? Well, no. All right, then. He sent you anyway. So grab a hold of the wheel, put your face into the, the wind, and let the bullets whiz by your head. And as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And friends, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Now, who we've got our faith in? We have our faith in Jesus. Listen, Elkton Baptist Church, God has a plan for you. A plan to prosper you, Jeremiah says. A plan to give you a future. Get to it. God, what do you want us to do next? What's next? And don't get caught up with being busy. Get caught up with being righteous. Getting right with God. Doing what God would have us to do. Lord, lead us by your hand. Let us do what you do. And God, where we see you working, help us go there. And you know what I think? I think he's faithful to do just that. And he will come into you, live with you, revive you, encourage you, forgive you, heal you, empower you. He will give you all the things you need, but you have to put your faith in Him and say, Lord, as best I can, I'm going to live for you and I'm going to tell everybody, including the guy who delivers propane to me, I'm going to tell all of them about Jesus and who Jesus is and what He's done for me. I pray today not only your churches, but churches all across our land. That God's people will rise up, not looking for a bigger church or the next hot button or the next great book. Well, we have a great book. Don't we have a great book? Amen. Gosh, we just need to read the one we got. Right? And just do what God calls us to do and then give Him the glory. Amen. And when we do that, I think we will find that we are blessed. And when we begin to identify the blessings, then God will begin to pour more and more blessings in our lap. But the main thing, not so much the blessings being poured in our lap, but is that he looks at me and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You may be here tonight and you may say, in my heart I know, that God is not saying to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, I don't know that. Danny doesn't know that. Others around you may think they know that, <laughs> but they don't. But you do. And truthfully, you're the only one that matters. To say to him, God, I'm falling short of the mark. Help me to live to the mark. You do that. Just a minute, we're going to have an invitation. You can kneel, you can bow, you can come forward, you can do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Come take me by the hand. Uh, come take Danny by the hand. But whatever you want to do, whatever you do, hear the Holy Spirit tonight and say yes to Him. Close with this one statement. You remember when Jesus turned the water into wine and Mary came and got Him? And she brought Him to the servants and he said, woman, what do I have to do with thee? Now, that got me smacked, I'm telling you. But not him. Remember what Mary told those servants? Whatever he says, do that. That's the best advice I know in all of Scripture. When you hear Jesus speak to you, do that. In just a minute, some of you are going to hear him. 
I want you to do what He's asking you to do. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege, Lord, of getting to preach your word. God, what a privilege it is to be called a pastor, a preacher. Lord, what a privilege it is to stand before your people and share your word. God, without you, I am but an empty, wretched shell. But Father, with you and with the power of your word, Father's men's lives can be changed. Not just me, but Lord, everyone in this house. Lord, speak to these men and women who have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus for the purpose of sharing their life with a lost and dying world that they might come to know you. God, call us out of the pews tonight. God, call us out from under our crouched hiding places. God, call us out from our arrogance and our pride. And Lord, help us to simply humbly say, as Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Use me. Oh God, use me for your glory and use me tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.